Hello and welcome to Pittsburgh City Council's public hearing for Wednesday, October 23rd, 2019. My name is Kim Clark Baskin and I am the Deputy City Clerk. With us today, we have our sign language interpreter, John Blasco. The following is a referendum question proposed for the 2019 general elections ballot. Shall the Pittsburgh Home Rule Charter be amended to establish a dedicated parks trust fund beginning in 2020 to improve, maintain, create, and operate public parks, improve park safety, equitably fund parks in underserved neighborhoods throughout Pittsburgh, be funded with an additional 0.5 mil levy, which is $50 on each $100,000 of assessed real estate value, secure matching funds and services for a charitable city parks conservancy and assure citizen participation and full public disclosure of spending. That concludes the topic of the public hearing. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being present at this City Council Cablecast public hearing for today, Wednesday, October 23rd, 2019. I'm Councilman Krause. I will be chairing this evening's public hearing. We are joined by Council Members Gross, Harris, Strasburger, and O'Connor. I believe other members will be joining us as their schedules permit. Um, we always begin the public hearing by reading the purpose of the bill, but I need to uh, perhaps maybe clarify some misunderstandings that council has a role in voting on this. This is actually a proposed ballot question, which was organized through a democratic process, put on the ballot for your consideration and for your vote. It, will not, it did not originate on the council table. It will not be voted by council. So we have, since we called for this public hearing to hear from you, there has been some communication to offices that somehow council is going to have a role and actually take a vote on this. And I wanna make certain that I clarify any misunderstanding that could be out there. This is going to be your initiative, your decision. So it is up to you to read, to educate yourself, to talk to your neighbors, to make certain that you understand uh, and have full clarity on what you will be asked to vote on come November the 5th. So with that, we are going to re read the proposed ballot question, though it is not a bill before city council. That makes sense, I hope. Proposed Pittsburgh Park Conservancy tax referendum on the 2019 general elections ballot. Proposed ballot question. Shall the Pittsburgh Home Rule Charter be amended to establish a dedicated park trust fund beginning in 2020 to improve, maintain, <clears throat> create, and operate public parks, improve park safety, equitable fund parks in undeserved neighborhoods throughout Pittsburgh, be funded with an additional 0.5 mil levy, which is $50 on each $100,000 of assessed real estate value, secure matching funds and services from a charitable city parks conservancy, and assure citizens' participation in full public disclosure of spending. Okay, Madam Clerk, thank you very much. So with that, I am going to read our basic ground rules, if you will, for how we are going to conduct this public hearing. Uh, we will accept we will accept excuse me testimony from registered speakers of which we have about 21 and 12 33 registered speakers we ask that when you come to the podium you begin by giving your name and the neighborhood in which you reside for our public record the green light will indicate the start of your three minutes when the yellow light comes on you'll have one minute to collect your thoughts and summarize when the red light comes on your time will have expired 
Uh, we ask that you would please relinquish the podium because we want to be mindful of everyone that has taken time to come here this evening to speak before City Council. Um, after we have exhausted the list of registered speakers, anyone that is here in the audience that did not register but wishes to register comment this evening, you will be given one minute uh, to register your comment. So with that, I am going to begin with our list of registered speakers. Our first registered speaker wishing to speak in favor of the proposed ballot question is Frederick Bonsi. And Frederick, you will be followed by Rich, Rick Knorr. Good evening, welcome. Thanks for coming down. Uh, good evening and thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Frederick Bonsi. Uh, I'm a resident of the Point Breeze neighborhood, live on Dallas Avenue. Um, I'm also a landscape architect and an urban designer who has worked on park-related projects across the country. My firm did work on the 2000 uh, Regional Parks Master Plan along with its 2015 update. And that showcased what a great resource we have in our parks but it also showed the investment that we needed to bring our parks to meet the current needs of our residents. Our parks, both regional and national, are in desperate need of investment for both capital and maintenance projects. It is estimated, and some of you know this, that there's a backlog of $400 million in capital improvement projects and a shortfall of up to $13 million a year in maintenance. The Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, along with the city, has raised over $122 million since that first master plan to improve our parks' natural systems and uh, do capital projects. Our legacy foundations have published almost half of that. Uh, I'm sorry, funded almost half of that. The introduction of RAD dollars has helped raise additional support, but is earmarked solely for our regional parks and not our neighborhood parks. With all of this success, we are still losing ground to enhance our parks for every resident. We are woefully short on dollars for both capital improvements and maintenance. Comparing uh, Pittsburgh to other cities of similar size and population, Cincinnati has a park budget of $47.4 million, uh, equivalent to $153 per person uh, uh, spent on parks. Cleveland has a budget of 39.2 and spends $102. Pittsburgh has a budget of 25 million or so and spends $83, 25% less than Cleveland, a city uh, similar to our size. You can also look at Minneapolis, a city defined by its park system and it's a number one park system in the country. Their budget is 144 million, $347 per person. And if you ask people there, that is a one reason that they do not mind paying the taxes because of the quality of their parks. We need to reach higher. These benchmark cities are our competition for growth, for attracting new business and new jobs. Park today, parks today are an integral economic development strategy for most cities and Pittsburgh must join them. Great parks are a great foundation for cities. They build communities, they are proven economic, or economic stimulators. They create jobs, they improve health and healing. They are a means to educate and connect us to nature. And most importantly, they are welcoming for all. Thank you very much, hey, I thank appreciate you. it. I was re remiss in saying, if you have brought written remarks and you wish to register them with the clerk, you are welcome to leave them. Uh, we will receive them and we will distribute them to all members uh, so that they have them for the record. Our next uh, speaker is Rick Knorr and you will be followed by Michelle Traficanti. Rick, good evening, welcome. Good evening, council members and fellow Pittsburghers. My name is Rick Knorr and I am from Brookline. I have never found it necessary to speak in front of City Council until now. The reason for this is the parks tax ballot question being discussed here tonight. As a person who uses our parks daily, I must say that well-maintained parks are a benefit to all of our city residents and visitors. But we must also consider other factors when asking our property owners for a tax increase. The ex for example, how will this increase impact the finances of our low and fixed income homeowners. There are also other things that need to be considered, which I think are more pressing, such as vital infrastructure improvements that have been neglected for a long time, such as road repairs, the need to remove hundreds of abandoned homes and clean up the city's blighted properties, the need to replace toxic water lines, the list of vital needs goes on and on. This tax increase fails to address any of these important issues. 
So why are the parks a top priority? One needs to look no further than the deep political relationship between the mayor's office and the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. As a paid public servant, the mayor should be first working in the interest of all citizens of Pittsburgh, not just the narrow interests of the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. With this in mind, I would like to move on to what is not being mentioned in the ballot question, but is very re relevant to this discussion. Most important, I believe, is the creation of the Parks Trust Fund Board that will be given the task to dispense funds as they see fit. The Trust Fund Board will be selected, not elected, and will be dominated, I believe, by the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. Also, what is not known about the Parks Trust Fund Board are the rules that govern this body, such as how will the members be selected? How many members will be on this board? What are the bylaws? And why do we need a board in the first place? Why would people be asked to vote on this issue without the rules of this board first being firmly established? There are too many questions and not enough answers. That's why I will be voting no on November 5th, this election day. In closing, I would like to say to Mayor Peduto, I implore you, please, first get back to the basics, clean up our neighborhoods, and fix the roads. Thank you, and have a good evening. Well, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Michelle, you're up next. Uh, you'll be followed by Robert Gary. Welcome. My name is Michelle Trafficani, and I reside in Brookline. 33 years ago, when I first spoke in this chamber, 33% of the land area in Pittsburgh was tax exempt because of nonprofit status. Today it is 45% of Pittsburgh property is tax exempt. Does this not trouble you? It truly should. Instead of going to the large nonprofits and asking for money in lieu of taxes, as was the practice in past administrations, you have chosen to come back to the well, the property tax paying citizens. The city ballot question for the November 5th election is a backdoor tax on the same group of people you always dump on. While parks are an important part of our city, not as important as the bike lanes, of course, they are not exclusively used by city residents. Maybe you should consider a user's fee. If that does not appeal to you, then consider asking to have the 7.7 .7 million that comes to the parks from the Connie Rad tax reassessed to be used for all parks instead of just five. And one more option. Let's ask the mayor to use the $60 million surplus from the upcoming budget to fund the parks. In his preliminary budget, he, he professed there would not be a tax increase. This is just not true. This parks tax placed on the November 5th elected day, election day ballot is in fact a tax increase. I have made four suggestions. Ask the nonprofits for money, charge a user's fee, reassess the RAD tax, or use the budget surplus. And finally, you should take a look at this underhanded campaign that has been conducted by the mayor and the Parks Conservancy. Where did all the money come from to promote the parks tax agenda that includes TV ads, radio, and direct mail? This deceptive marketing effort never mentions there will be a permanent forever tax increase on the 55% of us that pay property tax. Please vote no on this backdoor tax on November 5th. It could be the most important reason for you to vote. Thank you. Robert Gary, are you in the room? Uh, you, then we are going to go to Pat Gianella. Are you here, Pat? No, he's not here. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to Julie Segner. Are you here? Yes. No? Julie, are you here? No. Next is Heather Sage. Heather, I know you're here. Welcome. Thank you for coming down. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Heather Sage. I reside in Lawrenceville. I do work at the Parks Conservancy, but tonight I'm here to reflect my own views as a Pittsburgh resident and as a voter and as a parent 
and as a neighbor, and as someone who has enjoyed the benefits of Pittsburgh's large and varied system. When I was a kid, my family struggled to make ends meet. We never went on a family vacation, but our free time was nearly always spent outdoors, at playgrounds and at parks, and at an amazing arboretum that was close to the place where I grew up. And when we got together with our extended family, we often celebrated birthdays or anniversaries in parks. As I scan back over my childhood, my memories are filled with time spent exploring, playing, eating, and enjoying time in parks. And as I scan my life, it's very difficult for me to find too many places I've lived, visited, or spent time that didn't include parks. And I'll admit, I took parks for granted, almost entirely. It wasn't until much later in life that I came to understand how complex and challenging parks are to plan for, design, construct, and the hardest of all, to maintain. It was also much later in life that I came to understand how privileged I was, and am, in countless ways. I find as I traveled with a keener eye and a deeper set of experiences, I saw that there are stark differences between the haves and the have-nots, particularly here in Pittsburgh. And this is very clear in our parks and recreation system. The facts are that half of our treasured park system is in fair or poor condition, and that half is overwhelmingly in Pittsburgh's predominantly black neighborhoods. And it's not okay for my daughter to have a good, safe, and inviting park where she can enjoy herself and make memories, and for someone else's daughter to not have that experience unless she goes way outside of her own neighborhood. So I say yes, yes to paying my small share to ensure that a generation of Pittsburgh's kids can enjoy a good park or a rec facility. And I say yes so that the hardworking people of the city's Department of Public Works and Parks and Recreation have the resources and the equipment and the training that they need and deserve to give Pittsburghers the maintenance and programming we deserve. And I say yes to dedicating dollars for parks and recreation in its own fund so that shifting political winds don't leave kids, seniors, or anyone without the public assets in good shape. I'm proud to vote yes on November 5th to support Pittsburgh Parks for All. Thank you. Okay, Heather, thank you for coming down. Uh, forgive me, I'm gonna try to pronounce this Lisa, Lisa Goder. If I said that correctly, Lisa, are you here? Okay, uh, is John Steffen here? You are. Welcome, John. Thanks for coming down. You'll be followed by Brenda Smith. Hi, John. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm uh, an Aspinwall resident, but I live within two blocks of uh, your tr water treatment plant. But tonight I'm here to speak on behalf of the, uh, the Negley Run Watershed Task Force, which has uh, active participation from the six or seven neighborhoods of the Negley Run Watershed. And on behalf of its uh, community leaders group, I am here to underscore the critical role of parks funding and sustaining quality urban communities. Negley Run itself flows down through Highland Park. Most people know it as Washington Boulevard, but the area remains very much a stream valley and public space. In fact, community plans are beginning to capture the opportunity to expand the woodland space of Highland Park with fingers of green or blue um, Larimer, in fact, has a continuous green space vision reaching to within a block of the busway uh, via the new Liberty Green Park. Uh, but there are also numerous public parks in the watershed. Chadwick, Baxter Parklet, Homewood Field, Westinghouse, Mellon, Larimer, each has a role to play in the neighborhood. And with investment, each can bring social, cultural, economic, and environmental benefits to these urbanized neighborhoods. But without adequate baseline funding for upkeep or more funding dedicated for park improvements, these multiple co-benefits will never be realized. As a watershed, our favorite example of a co-benefit of quality parks is that each of these parks and parklets can collect and convey rainwater toward Allegheny River and keep the water, wastewater out of our sewers. There is no way this will be done by parks funding alone. There's no way this will be done by the city alone. But these, are, these visions uh, require investments from all different sources. There's a role for PWSA, for Alcasan, for PennDOT, for the Army Corps, for the state, for all, uh, for many other potential partners, too numerous to list. 
but without a, a reliable source of funding for baseline stewardship, these un, uh, other investors will be discouraged away. So I just uh, encourage the city um, and its voters to consider having a good baseline uh, credible source of funding for its open space so they could provide all the services put, that they can. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks very much for coming down. <laughs> Hi, Brenda. Welcome. Thanks for being here. You'll be followed by Stacy Branch. Thanks. Good evening. I am Brenda Smith. I'm the executive director of the Nine Mile Run Watershed Association. As you know, the Nine Mile Run stream in Frick Park was the site of a nearly $8 million, 100 plus acre restoration that was managed by the US Army Corps of Engineers and completed in 2006. 13 years later, the Army Corps considers it their most successful urban stream and wetland restoration. In partnership with the city's Department of Public Works and the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, our organization has monitored and stewarded the restoration since its completion. Every year, through a variety of events and classes, we educate more than 500 children and adults about watershed ecology, native species, water quality monitoring, and so on. Our volunteers regularly remove trash and invasive species from the stream and surrounding areas and continue to plant native species. Because the restored stream is in an urban area, it suffers from the ill effects of excessive stormwater runoff, including both resulting sewer overflows and the extreme volume and velocity of stormwater flows during every major rain event. Over time, this has resulted in serious damage to some portions of the restored area. In 2009, and again between 2015 and 2018, the Watershed Association raised more than $50,000 each time to complete needed repairs. There's no doubt that future repairs will be needed the increase in the amount and intensity of rain we are experiencing guarantees that. And just as another example, right now the installation of a new bridge to Duck Hollow is causing construction damage to the stream that will have to be fixed. An urban stream is never going to be something you can walk away from and consider finished, and it's more difficult to raise funds to do these kinds of repairs each time. But we believe it's worth the continued effort and financial investment because this large area of the park has been transformed from a dangerous eyesore into a beautiful oasis that is frequented by dog walkers, bikers, <laughs> photographers, and all manner of nature lovers. It's a rare example of a huge scale native habitat in the greater Pittsburgh area. So this is just one example among hundreds in the city's park system of ongoing needs that are not met by the amount that city that the city is currently able to budget for park maintenance and capital projects. For this reason, we are in support of the campaign to pass a ballot initiative to secure an ongoing stream of funding to maintain and improve our parks. I've been extremely impressed by the level of research and analysis that has gone into this effort. It's a very data-driven process. The Conservancy has detailed information about the needs um, and an impressive set of metrics to help prioritize how and where the funds raised will be spent so that they're spent equitably. Fundamentally, we're being offered a choice. Do we want to have a first-class park system that improves the quality of life for all Pittsburghers? If so, we need to find a way to pay for it. Thanks, Thank you. Brenda. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good. Is Stacy here? You are. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. You'll be followed by Barbara Warwick. Good evening, members of City Council and fellow city residents. My name is Stacy Branch, and I am a current City of Pittsburgh resident, and I have lived in the Observatory Hill area for 40 years and more. I am here tonight to express my concerns as to why I oppose the proposed Parks Conservancy tax and why I, I will be voting no on the referendum on November 5th. First of all, there are currently too many Pittsburgh residents who are struggling to pay their current bills and mortgages. About one third of Pittsburgh's population lives at or near poverty level and are living on an annual household income of 50,000 or less. And that's for a family of four. These families are just one step away from a financial disaster and losing their home. The majority of city residents just cannot afford to pay another tax. Recent
Recently, I had a letter published in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette expressing my concerns about how a majority of our 165 parks are in such disrepair and how it brings sorrow to my soul. In recent years, many of our parks, especially those in the lower income areas, have been severely neglected and not properly maintained. And this is unacceptable. Take, for instance, Riverview Park. That's my park. There are currently seven active landslides. Seven. Does the city park system need additional funding? Yes. And I strongly agree that there is definitely a need for this additional funding to ensure that future generations can enjoy the same experience that I had the opportunity to. However, I am against homeowners having to pay an additional tax to fund this. Why has City Council and the Mayor not pursued the large nonprofit organizations such as UPMC, Highmark, University Pitt, CMU, it goes on and on, and many others who currently do not pay taxes because they are tax exempt. Do you know that approximately 40 to 50% of the assessed city properties fall into the tax exempt category? If these organizations can afford to pay their CEOs millions of dollars each year, I am quite sure that they can afford to pay an annual agreed upon payment each year to help fund our city parks. Now is the time us voters can make these large nonprofit organizations pay their fair share and funding of our parks should be the first of it. Our parks are... Um, it goes fast. I'm sorry. Stacey. Oh, okay. Three minutes thank for... you very much. No, thank you for coming down. <laughs> Barbara, are you with us? You are. Thank you. Uh, you'll be followed, followed by Jane Miller. Thank you. Welcome for being here. Hi, yeah, my name is Barb Warwick. Um, I live in Four Mile Run. So um, anyway, let me just uh, open by saying that I am a big lover of our parks. Uh, I'm a daily walker. I have four young kids. I use the parks every day. Um, I'm also, uh, you know, the work that the Parks and Conservancy does is good. I'm a Girl Scout leader. We do the, you know, Frick Environmental Center. We're there all the time. So, you know, good work to them. Um, I have seen quite a few of the Conservancy's plans to improve the parks. Some are interesting, good ideas, lots of potential. But there's one plan that causes me great concern, and that's why I'm here. Um, that is the restoration of the Four Mile Run and Panther Hollow watersheds. Um, in and of itself, this plan is vital. Uh, it aims to reduce stormwater entering into our city's overburdened sewer systems, uh, which has caused and continues to cause horrific flooding in the Four Mile Run neighborhood where I live. Um, Run residents have been begging the city for years to fix this flooding problem, so um, I commend the efforts uh, to start working on it now. Um, as stated on the Conservancy website, quote, this long-term restoration project aims not only to alleviate the stormwater issue, but to improve the health and aesthetics of Shenley Park. So, why then is this project tied to a Department of Mobility and Infrastructure project to run a two-lane paved roadway through Shenley Park? Now, if you're not familiar with this project, it's called the Mon Oakland Connector. I suggest everyone here look it up. Uh, the idea is to run shuttle buses through the park in order to ease access to and from Oakland for people in Hazelwood and Greenfield. Um, in addition to cutting through the park, this roadway will eliminate our activity field next to big gyms in the run and also our basketball court. Uh, so I have this binder uh, I'd like to pass it around to you first and then anyone else who'd like to see it just quickly. These are existing transit routes that we already have that we could improve and use instead of the park, which is right here. This is the area of the park that will be destroyed by this road. And then photos of the park. And then, just as an FYI, the very limited bus service that we have between these neighborhoods and Oakland, which, you know, obviously is a much easier fix. So I'm just going to hand this over. 
So if time. you're going to leave this with us, well, I, we're going to yeah, I can't leave it after, sure. Um, so anyway, I'm sort of running out of time. So at any rate, I'm not an expert, but it seems to me that uh, increasing greenery and minimizing development is the key to a green first approach to reducing flooding and protecting habitat, uh, not the other way around. Uh, at any rate. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, thank Barbara. you. It I'm goes, sorry I didn't have enough time to quickly. go through the whole thing. I just thing. have to warn you, it, it goes quickly. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for coming down. Uh, Hi, Jane. Welcome. You're next. Uh, Carl Suter. Uh, are you here, Carl? I don't think I saw. Is he here? He is. Okay. You'll, you'll follow Jane. Welcome, Jane. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you for having this public hearing this evening. And thank you for all the residents who showed up to speak. Um, the intent of this is that this really is about a democratic process and the residents of Pittsburgh speaking about how they feel about parks. So parks, how important are they? Some people will say they're not as important as police, fire, roads, or transportation. I disagree, and I think many others do. Parks truly are the foundation of any city. There are no public assets that provide as much to a community and especially to a city as parks. They fuel the economy. They make us healthier. They clean and cool the air. They manage stormwater. They renew our spirit. They create community, they are free to everyone, they are for everyone, they transform cities, and they are our most democratic spaces in any community. Spending for the referendum is laid out in the parks plan that was developed based on park needs, community needs, and public priorities garnered through an extensive community engagement process, and it will accomplish a lot for Pittsburghers and for the city of Pittsburghers. Three quarters of homeowners in the city of Pittsburgh will pay less than $66 per year or $1.26 a week if the referendum is successful. Continuing to defer park maintenance will increase the cost to our children and grandchildren. The referendum, if successful, will allocate $33.6 million to maintenance and rehabilitation projects just in the first six years. National experience suggests that if that work is deferred, the cost will become $168 million, a five-fold increase. <laughs> and also in the first six years, 18 neighborhood parks across 15 neighborhoods will be transformed through capital projects, and the referendum will raise $19 million for programming and facility improvements. 31% of the families in those 15 neighborhoods live below the poverty line compared to 15% citywide. 70% of the residents in these neighborhoods are non-white, compared to 34% citywide. These neighborhoods have also 41% obesity rates and 17% diabetes rates, compared to 30% and 10% citywide. These capital investments serve neighborhoods with the greatest needs. The referendum will also provide over $44 million in resources that can support green infrastructure to reduce carbon emissions, to mitigate, st mitigate stormwater runoff, and to, to hit four of the highest priority sewer sheds in the city. And lastly and mostly importantly, this effort and this referendum is not about me. It's not about the conservancy. It's about Pittsburgh and improving the quality of life Thank for you. all Pittsburghers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Carl, uh, welcome. Uh, Carl, you'll be followed by uh, Yvonne uh, Brown. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for coming. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the council. My name is Carl Sutter. I reside in Westwood. Um, it's amazing that I follow the director because it's just on their first page of their 990s in 2018, they had. 7,760,000 some odd dollars in revenue from uh, various entities throughout the city, but they also paid out 33 point, almost $3 million is what they paid out, which is roughly 50%. Most nonprofits fees are between 
uh, 15 and 20 percent, not 50 percent. They also employ 74 employees. Now, I live in the Western District, along with my councilman, Ms. Smith. Until this proposal, we never saw the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy in our area. Maybe one or two times with Aaron came for various functions, but we never Pittsburgh saw Parks anybody or any money. Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, I just want to Pittsburgh sure. Parks Conservancy. I'm sorry. Also, when Ms. Miller came from Minneapolis, they only had eight employees there, and they only spent 12% of their budget for operational expenses, not 50%. Plus, Ms. Miller owns almost $210,000 a year, which is four times more than the average median income in Pittsburgh. She almost makes twice as much as the mayor. And always speak of fair and equity. The other day I was out in Squirrel Hill. There's a Reitman Park. It's 1.5 acres. The city is investing $4.2 million to do this 1.5 acre park. How is that fair and equitable? Hey, Carl, thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown. I know you're here. You're next. Uh, you'll be followed by Alyssa Manspire. Welcome. My name is Yvonne F. Brown. I live in the Hill District. Um, I was, the main reason why I, come, I came is because I was told by an elderly white man that said, now the mayor is letting like the penguins invest in making a park what was that, maybe 30, 30 million for this park to, over our uh, roadway, and, but he's gonna put a tax on us for the parks that we already have. Um, I um, really is, I am disappointed in the mayor, and I'm so glad the young lady spoke about the road that they, all that cement they're gonna have to use, think about how much that is. Plus, I live at the top of the hill, Katie Ware Irvis. In order for us seniors to get to Mercy Hospital, we must take two buses. So instead of him making mayor, instead of you taking and using that, sit, that money for the cement, get us a bus. It could be even if, even if it's a shuttle down to Mercy Hospital. Do you understand? Katie Ware Irvis fought to build that for the seniors, poor seniors. But in order to go to the hospital, we're at the top of the hill. We must go through town and get another bus to come out of town. So I'm, not, I'm gonna vote no, and everybody else should. If you got that road, cement, do you understand? To make a road through there. And I'm not, I'm not that brilliant, but I do know that we have seniors to go to the hospital they must take two buses. I got a couple minutes because I wanted just to understand. I was on a bus because I was coming from city council. Two white men and one, he was in so much pain. And you could see it and his friend kept on saying, you're going to make it, man. You're going to make it. He has to go to hospital on the bus in a lot of pain. So people say, oh, wait a minute. You have the uh, tickets. You have, we have the... Uh, I can't think of it, but we have to pay tickets. I can ride the bus. I can ride the bus. I can make it, but there's some that can't. We must consider the elders. Tell the mayor, no cement road. road. I'm so glad she said that, because I know it's wrong. But there's also, they said, the one man said, if, the, if we would put a policeman, right, going out of town where all these roads are, you'll catch the trucks that are bearing down on us. He said, the mayor want to make money? Put a policeman there. Oh, they would you. catch the trucks that are bearing down and blowing their horn all day long. So we could all tell the mayor that there's some money that way. And no cement, I mean that, no cement road. We need buses to get to the hospital. Okay, Thank thanks, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Uh, hi, Alyssa. Nice to see you, welcome. Uh, you'll be followed by Robert Gatos. Thanks for coming down. 
Thanks to City Council for providing this opportunity to speak about such an important ballot issue. And thank you to our city employees who work so hard to ensure that their limited resources to manage and steward our parks can go as far as possible. And thank you also to the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy for doing all that they do to expand these resources. My name is Elisa Manspizer. I'm a resident, homeowner, and taxpayer of the city of Pittsburgh. And I'm also the executive director of Land Force, a nonprofit located at 201 North Braddock Avenue in Pittsburgh. <coughs> Landforce combines workforce readiness and land stewardship for people with barriers to employment. What this means is that we hire people who may be returning home from incarceration or are struggling with addiction, homelessness, or generational poverty. We provide training to prepare people to be successful employees, pay them $15 an hour to work on environmental restoration projects like habitat restoration, trail construction, vacant lot improvements, and green infrastructure projects all across Allegheny County, often in parks themselves and ultimately support their transition to family-sustaining jobs. Since our first season in 2016, we have hired 72 people and provided more than 30,000 hours of direct stewardship on more than 100 projects that have improved our shared environment. 75% of crew members complete their tenure with us, 95% of our finishers interview for other jobs, and 83% have job offers by the end of the season. At Landforce, we share many of the values in this ballot issue. We acknowledge that we live in a city where long-term disinvestment means that many neighborhoods are left without a safe place for children to play. We envision a city where every child and adult live within walking distance of a well-maintained and safe park, where parks can provide all neighborhoods a host of environmental services like flood mitigation and air quality improvements. We have seen firsthand how spending a day in one of our beautiful parks can contribute to physical and mental health. We envision a day where parks receive equitable investment, no matter where they are located. And when the day comes, we are ready and able to help ensure that these investments are used to support employment opportunities for people who have been overlooked for employment in the past. At Landforce, we believe that if we adopt a justice-oriented lens and think carefully about how to implement increased investments in our public spaces, in particular by investing in both the parks and the people who live near our most forgotten parks, it would be a big step towards becoming an all-in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thanks, Elisa. Thank you. Okay, Ron Gatos, are you here? Okay, no, uh, forgive me, Allison Keating. Welcome, thanks for being here, Allison. You'll be followed by Danielle Crumrine. Welcome. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Allison Keating. I live in Manchester. Hey, Allison, can I ask you to bend it up? Yeah, because we, we record this for our public record. Sorry? Thank you. Can we start okay. her over again, please, since she did that? Thank you very much. Sorry. My name is Allison Keating. I live in Manchester. I would like to start by acknowledging that Pittsburgh is situated on land that was claimed by way of two treaties, the 1768 and 1784 treaties of Fort Stanwix. Both were agreements with the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois, but this land was inhabited and used by numerous tribes that were not at those negotiating tables, including, but certainly not limited to, limited to the Lenape, Seneca, and Shawnee. A question for today could be, who has been left out of these discussions that created this petition by design or by other systemic structural barriers. In the spirit of the recent hearing on reparations, I'd like to acknowledge the historical violence that mostly black people have faced in our parks. I live on the north side and I often explain to people that Lake Elizabeth and Allegheny Commons Park was actually used as a pool for quite some time in the 20th century. Back then, black chi <laughs> but then black children wanted to go swimming too. Soon enough, when the United States joined the Second World War, the city saw an opportunity to close the pool and use it as use it to collect scrap metals. It never reopened as a pool. That fact was somehow left out of the National Historic Nomination that was written several years ago for the park by the Allegheny Commons Initiative. The Parks Conservancy has tried to align this tax with the incredibly popular library tax, and this is a wrong comparison. That tax wasn't a charter amendment. That tax didn't create yet another board for citizens to oversee. The library isn't perfect, and they, just like the Department of Public Works and the Parks Conservancy, continue to struggle to hire staff that looks like the population they serve. But we have faith in them because we know a fundamental aspect of the library profession is to not silence anyone, even if you don't agree with them. In addition, the library is a member of the Allegheny County Library Association, meaning that city residents can request books 
owned by other member libraries for free, and a few other municipalities also have library taxes. This proposed tax provides no mechanism for non-city residents to pay their fair share, as they too frequent our parks that aren't funded through the regional asset district. Between the library, DPW, and the Parks, Cons parks Conservancy, only the Parks Conservancy is non-union. A recent report from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, Pennsylvania has the seventh worst tax inequality. This tax will exacerbate that for Pittsburgh residents, especially, especially renters, who are now the majority of households in Pittsburgh. We can't control Harrisburg where change is most needed, but we can create a Pittsburgh that doesn't make things worse for its most vulnerable residents. Renters aren't able to take advantage of the homestead exemption, which saves homeowners $120 on their city property taxes. With a $100,000 property, a renter will pay $50 and a homeowner will pay just $42.50. City Council could remove this disparity and increase city revenue by what I estimate is $8 million. The new realty tra transfer tax will, will take in about $15 million a year when fully implemented next year, yet only $10 million is dedicated to the Housing Opportunity Fund. City revenue is increasing, though the population is still decreasing. The foundations that fund the Parks Conservancy could... Be, you did good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did good. Yeah, and you you can you are welcome, even though your comments aren't written, you can send them digitally to us. We'll be happy to accept them. Uh, Danielle, welcome. Thanks for being here. You'll okay. be followed by Meg Cheever. Okay. Good evening, members of council. I'm Danielle Crumrine, uh, and I live at 737 South Braddock Avenue in Regent Square, District 9. Uh, I'm also executive director at Tree Pittsburgh, but I am not here representing the organization tonight. Um, so I'm here as a private citizen who cares deeply for the future of the city, a place I choose to live, work, and raise my two girls who are here with me tonight. I'm here to express my enthusiastic support for the referendum. I'm grateful to the Parks Conservancy for having the courage to take the lead on an issue that many are choosing to paint in a negative light, and in some cases with inaccurate or false information. 20 years ago, I got my start in the local envir environmental community when I organized a trash cleanup under the 10th Street Bridge in the South Side. I was inspired by elected officials at the time making bold moves to secure land and easements for public access to the Rivers and Greenways Network. They fostered public-private partnerships to invest in the future of our parks, our zoo, our conservatory, and our urban forests. We became known as the Phoenix Rising. Our city's reputation shifted from an old, dingy, industrial has-been to a vibrant green city with a growing tax base. Those bold decisions made in the 90s and 2000s were not always popular, as many of you remember. But now we easily recognize just how forward-thinking they were. We have the privilege of reaping the benefits of those decisions today. Unfortunately, while we've come a long way, our city still has a long way to go. Our air is bad, our sewage regularly flows into our rivers, and the quality and accessibility of our park system is not equal across all neighborhoods. The parks dotted throughout the city are in dire need of investment. To me, this referendum will again be a defining moment for the city. And as you said in the beginning, it's not all of you voting. This is not a council move. This is us. This is the citizenry of this city saying, we're taking control of this. And I think we should still go after the nonprofits that owe tax, right? Residents have the opportunity to choose to make an investment in our public park system, prioritizing those neighborhoods with greatest need. And if you listen closely to the plan, that is how it's going to go down. The maintenance in the parks, the tree planting that will happen in the parks, this will all help to clean our air and protect our waterways and ease our stressed out minds that we, we suffer in this hectic world. I have one important request of this council. If you come out against the referendum, if the referendum doesn't pass, use your privilege, use your platform to develop an alternative solution, you heard a few here tonight, that would match the potential of this public investment. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, we'll, we'll wait for a moment. Let People that need to leave go. Okay. I won't take it personally. <laughs> Hi, Meg. Welcome. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Meg Cheever. I'm retired. I'm a taxpayer and a resident of Council District 8. I founded the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. Parks are not a frill. Parks are a healthful place for free exercise. 
The tree population in our parks cools and cleans the air. Parks are beautiful. People want to live in a beautiful place. If you have a house and you let the yard go, the grass and the weeds grow tall, the front gate is off its hinges, you aren't proud of your house. No one wants to buy it, no one wants to visit you, and it might even be dangerous. Well, if our parks are all broken down and horrible, it's a reflection on our community and people won't want to live here. That was the situation 24 years ago when the Parks Conservancy formed. This is Shenley Park at that time. The city had total control of the parks, but no money. The building had been boarded up for 10 years and the park was almost impassable. Working with the city, the Conservancy helped turn the tide, raising $120 million and completing 20 capital projects. But there remains a $400 million backlog of overdue repairs in the 165 park system and the needs are too big for a private group to raise the funds alone. The Regional Asset District only gives money to Pittsburgh's five largest parks, parks like Sheridan, McKinley, Mellon Square downtown, and 157 more are left out. Parks are the most democratic spaces in society. They're the places where we build community. They're there for our family reunions, our soccer games, our cross-country races. They're the places where we go to be in nature when we need solace or alone time. They're the places where everyone can come together regardless of age, race, social position, income. Here's Highland Park before we invested almost $3 million. Now that it's restored and maintained, the entry garden is a magnet for people from all over. <clears throat> the time for increased public investment in the parks is now. Some people have mentioned alternate funding schemes, but that's a false choice because those other schemes, if they ever happen at all, are likely years away, and in the meantime, our parks will deteriorate more and momentum will be lost. And if this Parks Trust Fund is established and the city finds extra money, you can lower other taxes. The choice for Pittsburgh is whether we want a great park system for every person and every neighborhood in our city, or do we want to have a few nice parks in better neighborhoods and inequity everywhere else? If we want great parks, we need to vote yes for the increased and predictable funding that the Parks Ballot Initiative will provide. Thank you. Hey, Meg, thank you. Uh, Reverend Spencer Simon, are you here? Mr. Simon? Uh, is Brian McGee here? I'm sorry, forgive me. Mr. Who's, Mr. Spencer is here. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend, you'll be followed by Brian McGee. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, coming. Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, my summer with you. Um, we have uh, a have visual. Your address? Matter of fact, address? we have several visuals, okay? Um, neighborhood. Without the parks. East Liberty. I'm East sorry. Neighborhood. Would you please start, Mr. Spencer, over and allow me to chair the meeting? Reverend Spencer, you're welcome to begin your remarks again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm sorry I have a little hearing loss. Okay? You're fine. Okay. Thank you. So I. Uh, if I can start over again. Yes, please. Okay. You're welcome. I wanted to share our summer with council because without the parks, we couldn't have done what we did. We've seen more than 800 young people through the parks with a fishing program, no cost to them. And we were told that we could not actually restore the lake, Carnegie, Lake in Holland Park because it was too expensive. Well, with volunteer effort, we got all that done. We got all that done and we were looking to move forward. Mm -hmm. I want to stress the, the, the fact that regardless of how much money we think we have or we don't have, we will never be able to come up with enough to, to stop our families and the the crime that we're seeing in the, in the community. Fishing has allowed us to minister to these kids. We can talk to them. We have uh, opportunity to encourage the families. So, you know, we, we, need, we need to be very careful about the things that we cut back on. And we need the parks, we, we really do. Um, I have with me uh, Rodney Jackson, 
who was one of the members here. And uh, Rodney worked in the school district for quite a few years. So I want him to share with you some of the things that he saw. Hello, uh, my name is Rodney Jackson. And uh, if anyone hasn't been to Highland Park lately, take a ride up. We have a beautiful park there. Now they have a dog park and they also have volleyball facilities as well as the pool. But we have a lake that has been underutilized over the years. I fished there 50 years ago. I started fishing. Over the years, it fell in disrepair. But over the, over the summer, like uh, Reverend said, we've seen over <coughs> eight, 900 kids come through our program. And if you could just see their faces and that of their parents and grandparents when they caught their first fish, it, it was inspiring to think that once again, we can introduce uh, urban fishing to Pittsburgh. Uh, and like you said, it's all free. And just take a chance and just go out to see what we have out there at Highland Park. And again, we'll be starting up again. And usually when you see, sorry, usually when you think of urban, you think of blacks only, but I don't think these are black families only. We had Chinese families, other Asian groups. We had Middle Easterns. We had a number of different families from different ethnic groups that came out and fished. Some of them never fished and never knew this lake even exists. And they came in week after week after week. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. McGee, welcome. Uh, you're followed by Mildred Myers. Thank you. Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, we have, can, can we please, let's, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. McGee. Good evening, members of City Council. Thank you for calling this uh, hearing tonight uh, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Brian McGee. I'm a resident of Baldwin Borough, um, but I'm here tonight as the CEO of Pump, the largest network of uh, under 40 crowd here in the city of Pittsburgh, prim primarily between the ages of 25 and 35. We've got nearly 10,000 members. Um, the vast majority, upwards to 90%, live within the city limits. Um, I speak tonight to express our enthusiastic support for the Pittsburgh Parks for All referendum. If passed by the voters, the initiative will provide equitable, sustained, and critically important investments in parks across all the neighborhoods in the city. We believe that every person in every neighborhood should have access to safe recreational spaces and activities. This is one of the core ideals that young Pittsburghers shared with us again and again during our community planning process that resulted in our advocacy and public policy agenda that was released about a year and a half ago. As the largest permit user within the city's park system through our Pittsburgh Sports League program, Pump has a unique and broad advantage point of the needs in our park system. We work closely with city public work staff every day. They are true professionals, given what I'm sure seems to them at times a truly impossible task caring for the parks. We frequently work with many of you as well, and we thank you for, for your support of young people. It is true that safe places to recreate and open space is essential to retaining and attracting young people. On any given night throughout most of the year, you can find thousands of pump members and PSL participants gathering in parks and facilities across the city, recreating and connecting through sport and play. We know exactly how important parks and community gathering spaces are to thriving, vibrant, and equitable neighborhoods and communities. The PSL itself was founded 17 years ago with this knowledge and understanding, and it's been the proverbial runaway train ever since. We see these benefits every day through our experience in the parks. We also see firsthand through these very same experiences how the lack of available funding and resources has severely limited our city's ability to ensure and maintain quality park experience for every last person who is here. Far too many of our parks have fallen into a state of disrepair and neglect from decades of limited investment. Aging and inaccessible playgrounds, ball fields without proper amounts of dirt, poor drainage or regular and basic maintenance for safe play are all examples of all too frequent occurrences in our park. We paid $70,000 in city permits several years ago. We're now down to $50,000 a year. That's because the, uh, the opportunities are vanishing. This year, for the first time ever, we have actually declined avail available permits because the field conditions were so poor in some cases. We don't see this turning around. No city can be great or most livable if it leaves people behind. In many of our neighborhoods, we are left with nostalgic memories of our parks about what once was rather than what is. If we, are become, 
we are to become a city for all, this needs to change. This comprehensive and community parks driven plan does just that. Thank you, Brian. We're gonna be working to Thank you. see a yes vote. Thank you. Uh, Mildred, are you here? Hi, welcome Mildred, thank you for being here. You'll be followed by Jeremy Feinstein. Welcome. Good evening, I'm Millie Myers. I live in Squirrel Hill, but I grew up in Highland Park and I still swim in the Highland Park pool each summer. To me, the Highland Park pool is living proof that parks are our most democratic spaces. People interact there who would never otherwise cross paths. People of different races and ethnicities and ages and professions. I'm a Carnegie Mellon faculty member. In conversations with a young lifeguard a few years ago, I was able to steer him toward educational opportunities he wouldn't have discovered otherwise. Just last weekend, I had a wonderful encounter in the Giant Eagle with the woman who staffs the pool gate every day. She somehow recognized me in clothes and dry, and, and we had a great conversation that was great because each of us realized that our lives intersect in ways that we wouldn't normally think of, all because of a city swimming pool. In that pool, I see little kids eyeing each other's toys and circling and talking to each other, and then their mothers start talking to each other. And the next day, those two groups, family groups, maybe it's one white, one black, maybe it's one white, one Hispanic, they're sitting next to each other and they're talking and their kids are playing together. <clears throat> Only in our public parks do these kinds of interactions occur naturally. Now, Highland Park is a rad supported park, but 160 of our 165 Pittsburgh parks don't get RAD funding. Those parks are dependent on the city. As a member of the Parks Conservancy Board, I was involved in the restoration of Cliffside Park, now August Wilson Park, in the Hill District. I saw the pride of ownership that occurred when community <coughs> groups partnered with the city to change that derelict neighborhood danger spot into a safe place where kids can play and people can enjoy being outdoors. The park's plan that will be implemented if this referendum passes will focus on restoring the neighborhood parks that most need it, the ones the city hasn't been able to keep up, the ones that don't get RAD funding. I know of no other community resource that brings democracy and equity to every Pittsburgher the way that our city parks can do that. I support this plan because I want Pittsburgh as a city to become the community that the Highland Park pool creates among those of us who swim there each summer. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. That's great. Okay, hi, Jeremy. Uh, you'll be followed by Aaron Copeland. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm Jeremy Feinstein. I'm from Squirrel Hill. Um, I am a member of the board of the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. I've uh, been there for nine years, but that's really not why I'm here speaking tonight. I'm speaking as a resident and person raising a family in the city, and it's a little hard uh, batting this deep in the batting order to come up with new and original things to say. So I'm just gonna dig deeply on one point that to <clears throat> me is the most compelling reason why every taxpayer in the city should support this initiative, and that is equity. The initiative is the best hope that we have to ensure that every resident of the city in every neighborhood gets fair access and fair funding for nearby parks based on real community needs. It's just a bit of background. I live about exactly equidistant between Frick and Shenley parks and I'm walkable to both. Those parks have enriched the <laughs> lives of my family and friends and neighbors. In so many ways, it's hard to list them all. My kids and I have played, by my count, at least 10 different organized sports in Pittsburgh parks, at least if you consider lawn bowling a sport. Uh, not to mention spending a huge amount of time on the beautiful trails and biking, and sledding, and so many other activities. I even proposed to my wife in a Pittsburgh park. For me, the tax referendum is above all about park funding equity so that all other Pittsburghers can share those same opportunities and that requires fairness in terms of the ways that we distribute 
park and neighborhood funding. The restoring Pittsburgh parks plan would be supported that would be supported by this referendum sets forth a simple and transparent formula for determining the communities and parks that will get uh, that will get the funding based on the greatest needs and it allocates the funding to the parks with greatest needs. The projects that will be done with the funds are published publicly on the Restoring Pittsburgh Parks website for everyone to see in rank order and yes even to criticize and to question. That's the whole point. You can see the formula, you can see where the money will go, you can see the priorities and that's valuable in itself even if you don't think the priorities are exactly right. I think that's what's so great about this referendum. The sites in the communities with the greatest needs are going to get the parks investment that they've, that they've been waiting for for years. Take a look at even just the top dozen or so parks on that list and you'll see how the initiative will do great things across so many council districts. Spring Hill Park in District 1, West End Park in District 2, McKinley Park in District 4. I could keep going. You'd see almost all of them there. <clears throat> The RAD funding that makes it possible to do capital improvements and major, and major maintenance projects in Frick, Shenley, Highland, and Riverview um, gives them a leg up on other city parks. And the incredible positive impact of that funding is obvious to anyone who visits any of them. The real magic of this initiative and the real reason why both council and everyone else should support it is that equity. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. <laughs> Aaron? Uh, Aaron Copeland, thank you. Linda Haddad, you'll be next. Good evening. My name is Aaron Copeland. Um, I live in Highland Park at 1414 North St. Clair Street, and I do work for the Parks Conservancy. I'm the senior restoration ecologist there, and I'm voting yes on the Parks Trust Fund. There are many reasons. Um, my local park is Highland Park, and someone from my family is there almost every day. And although the DPW tries their hardest to keep everything in good working order, there just isn't enough baseline funding to go around. Just one small example is that on our walk to the pool this past summer that Millie spoke about so kindly and that I agree with wholeheartedly, my niece fell on some steps, original to the park, a historic resource that are just beautiful, but they're being eroded away. And this is a rad park, so they get, it gets extra funding. Think about the other small community parks and neighborhood parks that don't. And I know that the staff there sees that it needs to be fixed, but there's not really enough funding to go around. The park system is one of the most valuable resources in the city. Um, and it seems to be eroding away, kind of like those steps. A dedicated parks trust fund is needed to complete the $400 million capital project backlog, as well as the $13 million that's a deficit in maintenance funding. And here's another reason that I'm voting yes. And it has to be, it has to do with the lens that I see the world in sometimes as an ecologist. Parks are natural infrastructure. They're not necessarily the gray um, sewer lines or the asphalt roads, but they do very similar kinds of things in soaking up water and providing circulation for animals or for us as humans. So um, we desperately need this natural kind of infrastructure. Pittsburgh's parks, this, specifically the trees and shrubs and other vegetation, they're good at cleaning air and soaking up water keeping our human community healthy. With climate change impacts already being felt, such as increased precipitation, increased landslides, not just seven in Riverview, but across the whole system, additional funding is needed to plant new trees, care for the old trees, install green stormwater infrastructure. These actions can help right now. It'll help mitigate Pittsburgh's terrible air quality, reduce raw sewage into the rivers that we drink from, Ah, but in the future, this funding will also be needed to ameliorate the worst of climate change impacts that Pittsburgh will experience, like increased urban heat island effect that hurt, hurts the elderly and the young the most, the increased precipitation, the increased landslides. <coughs> city parks are basic infrastructure that keep Pittsburgh as a most livable city, and an increase in the funding to them will benefit us all in cleaner air, cleaner water, and a healthier human community. Essentially, investments in the parks are investments in ourselves, our families, and our neighbors across the entire city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Linda, hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. And Leanne uh, DeCicico, I hope I didn't butcher that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good. Uh, welcome, Linda. Thank you. 
My name is Linda Haddad. I live in Point Breeze. Um, but in my journey through Pittsburgh, I started in Oakland as a student. And when I got my first job, I lived in Shadyside. And I've lived in Point Breeze now for many years. And in each place, I probably spent most free moments in one or more of the parks, which is how I got here tonight. I happened to be at a meeting, and I saw somebody with a name tag that said Meg Cheever. And I wanted to tell her how much I had appreciated the work and the parks. And she said, well, if you mean that, come on Wednesday night. So here I am. Um, and so much of what I have to share is repetitive, but I think it's valuable to repeat. Um, when I, tra I travel with my work, and I have lots of opportunities to brag shamelessly about our city, and I take all of them. But when I do, I lead with the parks because that is what is so unique. I get a chance to visit Central Park in New York and the River Parks in Portland, and I see a lot of beautiful parks, but we'll, we compare with anybody, and it's been a great treasure. We have in the city, as you all well know, world-class art and theater and music and culture, um, but it's expensive. Our parks are free, and they're available to everybody. And others have mentioned the democracy of it, but it's the kind of thing that has made me weep on occasion. I'll just tell you one story. I won't tell you all the times I've wept. One story is we came as tennis players. And in the early 70s, when we were students and tennis players, tennis was very popular here. And you could probably attest to that. Um, we knew that we would spend half the day waiting. So when you went to the tennis court, you'd take a blanket, you'd take a lunch, you'd take your homework, your books, and sit there for a very long time and get to see all the people coming and going. The way we got a court, Shenley only had, I think, a half a dozen courts then, was you'd sign up, and it was the honor system. You'd sign up, you'd go in order, and everybody got off the court in one hour, and before dark, most people who wanted to play got to play that day. But we also saw a lot of other things going on in the park. And my favorite day, perhaps, was a day we were sitting around waiting, waiting, and we hear a lot of ruckus from the road and a sea of kids, some in orange shirts and some in yellow shirts, running up the steps, running right past us and into the circle. Uh, turns out they were playing a game that was probably intended to be soccer or something like that. They were little, but they were enthusiastic, and they were multicolored, multi-ethnic. It was like such a treasure that... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. I've never met my time frame, but I'm thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for coming uh, down, Linda. Thank you. We'll get the, the finish of that at the end of the meeting, okay? Uh, Leanne, welcome, and you'll be followed by Gavin uh, White. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Leanne DeSico, and I live in Allentown. Oh, welcome. Thank you, Council. I am in favor of establishing a dedicated Parks Trust Fund for three reasons. First, I am a pediatrician, so I will speak on behalf of my patient population. Our children are facing tremendous obstacles to their health and well-being. Obesity, high blood pressure, depression, anxiety, social isolation, these are all the new scourges we face. And unlike polio and unlike pertussis, these have no vaccines, no quick preventable measure. Our children are also set to inherit a planet that is becoming increasingly broken. It is time for us as their adults to collectively step up and show them that their health matters, that their planet matters. Our children need safe, clean, well-maintained parks. My colleagues worked with the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy to establish the Prescription for Parks program in 2018, and passage of this fund would ensure that it, like our children, have the tools needed to thrive. Second, in order for our parks to be spaces in which we can feel restored, they must be clean. And our parks, just like our city and our planet, are filling up with improperly disposed garbage. This is all of the garbage I've picked up from Grandview Park since May. Grandview Park is eight acres, 
less than half a percent of the total park area in the city. I have read about the former caretaker of Grandview Park, Don Pinella, who tended to it for more than 30 years. His position was eliminated by the city upon his retirement several years ago. We may not need a whole army of Don Pinellas, but we need the funding to at least have one. Third, like any other Pittsburgher, I really like winning. Stanley Cups, Super Bowls, you name it. Jane Miller led Minneapolis to be ranked number one in public parks by the Trust for Public Land for five years in a row during her tenure. Pittsburgh ranks 22nd. We are therefore incredibly fortunate so that she chose to move here in 2018 to lead the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. This fund, part of Jane's strategy, has already proven to be effective in Minneapolis. I hope that the voters of Pittsburgh will recognize the winning game plan when it appears. With Pittsburgh's average home price of $130,000, this tax proposal would equal 18 cents per day. I found a dollar on my trash rounds in Grandview Park on Monday. So the next five days is on the house. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Gavin. Welcome. You'll be followed by Jamil Bay, but I don't think Jamil is here. So you'll be followed by Chris Zoransky. Hi, and thanks very much for the opportunity. My name is Gavin White. I'm a proud Hazelwood homeowner. I'm a proud Pittsburgher, and I am a proud Parks Conservancy employee. You may balk at that, but I think the number of us here really speaks to how much we care about this work. Um, I really want to speak about, uh, you know, I, I work also on the Hazelwood Initiative Board, and, and I really believe in this idea of development without displacement that we've just submitted as part of our neighborhood plan. So I recognize some of these other concerns that we've heard tonight, you know, about affordable housing, about the roads, about the bridges. Yeah, we got a lot of problems to deal with, and, and the reality is that we're, we're a city punching above our weight. We are a city of 300,000 people that happens to also have the most bridges in the world. Like, how does that, that doesn't make sense. We need to be able to invest in the massive but beautiful infrastructure that we have. So it, it was a shame to me to think that we have to sacrifice parks for roads or sacrifice bridges for affordable housing. We need to, as Democrats, as people who believe in our city, stand up and say that we can have all of these things. So I am proud to vote yes for the tax referendum. I'm proud to help anyone who thinks that there are people who that will displace. If, if that is an issue, please like reach out to me, really. My email is gwhite at pittsburghparks.org, and I'd be happy to help support those issues because it's not a one or the other kind of solution. Parks, as everybody has said tonight, are super critical. They do all of these amazing things. And on top of that, we can improve our other issues as well if we have more money to do it. Thanks very much. Hey, Gavin, thank you. Hey, Chris, you're up. Thanks for being here. Uh, David Demko, I know you're here, and you'll follow Chris. Welcome. Hey, thank you. And thanks to the council here. I'm glad to see there's seven out of nine members. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm supporting the tax. I'm Chris Sarowski. I live in Squirrel Hill. And uh, one of the uh, things I've been thinking about is that this is more of a populist tax than a kind of an elitist tax. And we could take back a lot of control of our parks with this tax. This is putting the power back into the people's hands, the city residents' hands. Every, every neighborhood could have a Whiteman Park. That's what this tax could produce. Why don't you think so? No. <laughs> so it's a populist tax. It's a way to shift the focus away from the riverfronts, away from the nonprofits. And it's also a, a piece of leverage for council to use to get back in the game, have a say over what happens to the parks, put pressure on the nonprofits to pay their share, show them that the people of Pittsburgh care about the parks and are willing to pay for them, and, and shame them into helping us. Uh, you know, I'll back up some of the observations about traveling. I've traveled quite a bit in my life. And in thinking about it, 
the places I remember most and most enjoyed are the places with the great parks and the great nature, right? Some place like uh, Hayes Woods, that could be world class. The views up there, the eagles in the city of Pittsburgh, a nice building up there, some access, that could be a world class tourist attraction. Uh, you know, Bruce, in Allentown, my grandparents lived there, I know it quite well. St. George's is their church. There's that parking lot between Warrington Avenue and St. George's, great big ground parking lot. That is crying out for a park, that's begging for a park there. What a way to knit the neighborhood together. Sell that, sell that to the people in Allentown. Tell them that that's what they can get with this tax. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm here from Squirrel Hill and Shenley Park. I just started the Shenley Park Tennis Association this year. I take care of a little patch of Shenley Park myself and uh, I pick up trash constantly. I need help. Uh, I think the Parks Conservancy did a survey and the number one concern of people answering that survey was trash in the parks. The city can hire people to clean up the parks. That's a simple job and an important job and everybody wants that done. Uh, I had a laundry list of problems with Shenley Park. You know, it's, it's, it's a park that's under extreme pressure from Carnegie Mellon's expansion, too much traffic, the shuttle bus through the run from CMU down to, uh, I forget where the person is from the run now, from CMU down to Hazelwood, every side is under pressure and we need to preserve the parks and we need to protect them. And I would really appreciate everybody getting on board with that. Thank you. Okay, thanks Chris. Okay, David, you're next, and you'll be followed by Ryan McWilliams. Hey, David, welcome. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, uh, my name is David Demko. I'm the Assistant Director of uh, Scenic Pittsburgh. I live on the north side on Boyle Street. Uh, it's a central, Alle central uh, Allegheny City now. Um, I live one block from um, uh, Allegheny Commons. Um, frankly, I I'm surprised that uh, Council hasn't given this uh, full throated support to this uh, referendum. Um, no one is more familiar with the budget than, than you. And you understand how hard it is to find money for anything. As the anti-tax people pointed out here, we have a lot of needs, uh, sewage, roads. And, and as you look at these things, and you, and you were in a way, well, do I pay for sewage, do I pay for parks? It gets harder and harder to find money to pay for the parks. Um, I'm on the steering committee for the uh, Allegheny Commons. And uh, our goal is to return the park to its original glory. Uh, it's it's uh, maintenance. We've lost a lot of things, a lot of features over the years, and, and our, our, our goal is to restore it. The estimate to restore it, $50 million. Um, is anyone here going to find $50 million in the budget for me? How about $5 million a year? How about a million for 50 years? No, it's not going to happen, is it? Um, I, I think the way you have to look at this, you know, it's, it's, what, what surprises me is that in 1867 we were able to build this park, but nowadays we can't afford to maintain it. Um, it it's a matter of what our values are and what we consider important in this city. And, and uh, to the anti-tax people, I would like to say what you need to look at this as, you need to look at this as an investment, not as a tax. And there's three reasons why it's an investment. First of all, it appreciates the value of our houses. There are studies, many, many studies that show that proximity to a park increases the value of your house. By investing in our parks, we will appreciate the value of our properties, and that's who's paying the taxes, property owners. So they will have more valuable property as a result of paying this tax. Um, uh, the, um, what's I put here? Um, you know, making your home more valuable, there's nothing wrong with considering um, your self-interest in, 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 in weighing the value of this tax. And, and having more valuable property is, is in everybody's self-interest, in property owner's self-interest. The second thing about this is, is parks are good for your health. Uh, take a walk, get some exercise, relax, it's good for your health. It's good for your kid's health. It's good for your dog's health. And it's good for the health of the planet, too, because the plants and the soil clean the water and they clean the air. And uh, third of all, um, you know, great cities have great parks. And Pittsburgh deserves great parks. We're a great city. We want to be a world-class city. We deserve great parks. Um, to the anti-tax people, I'd like to say, if this were um, for a park uh, for roads or for sewage, would you vote for it then? That would free up money for the parks. To put it in reverse. Let's vote for this. It'll free up money for roads and uh, sewage. 
Thank you very much. Okay, David, thank you. Okay. Hi, Ryan, welcome. You will be followed by our last registered speaker, Doug Croft. Welcome, thanks. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan McWilliams. I come from Swiss Helm Park. I'm a homeowner there. Uh, I wanna thank everybody, the council, for the opportunity to speak um, and everybody here uh, that are participating in this very democratic uh, event. I, this is the first time for me and I'm honored. So I am a proponent of the uh, referendum here. My background is in ecology and as an environmental consultant, I see um, the need to restore and conserve the resources that we have, not only for the public's use and enjoyment, but also for the ecological health of the environment and of the world. Um, I came here about six years ago, five or six years ago, and uh, was just a student out of school looking for an opportunity, and I found one in Pittsburgh. Um, I was able to have a good job and eventually become a homeowner, and now that's why I'm proud to have an opportunity to give back to the parks that I've used every single day, even when I didn't have enough money to go out to other fun opportunities in the evening, the arts and the music that were discussed earlier. Um, so the parks bring a lot of value, and this is, this is a resource, just like the roads and bridges, that need to be invested in, and if they are not invested in regularly, they will just cost more and more and more, and we'll be kicking ourselves in 10 years when we haven't taken care of this now. Uh, the park's investment helps the human environment. This helps uh, have an opportunity for people that may not be as fortunate to bring their children, uh, to learn more about the environment, to exercise, and uh, hopefully it inspires some young people to get involved with the environment, to learn about it, and maybe be better stewards when they're adults. Also, investing in the parks is better for the environment in general. I know we discussed briefly about stormwater being an issue. That's something I'm particularly interested and passionate in. Uh, the city has a very significant issue with stormwater, as you all well know, and working to invest in the parks here to restore streams and divert uh, water that would otherwise be going into our sewage system uh, is extremely important. So I hope that you will all consider this. Um, I thank you all for your remarks on both sides. I think uh, I don't really need to say much more since it's already been said several times. But uh, then again, I hope you'll consider the investment that, that is before us and that how this will have returns for many years to come. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Okay. Doug, are you here? Okay, that exhausts the list of registered speakers. If there is anyone that came to the public hearing this evening that did not register, that wishes to register comment, you are welcome to come to the podium. Again, begin by giving your name, the neighborhood in which you reside. You'll be given one minute, and I must caution you, it goes very fast. Welcome. Hi, my name is Ziggy Edwards. I live in the run. Hello again. I decided to speak today after finding this in my mailbox. It's the second or third direct mailing I've received telling me to vote yes. We owe it to our children. I don't appreciate the expensive full color printed paper that ends up in my recycling bin and I don't appreciate this deceptive marketing campaign directed at Pittsburghers. No one is arguing against funding parks. The issue is how. I have major concerns about this proposed fund and that doesn't make me a child hater or a park hater. I'm concerned because I live in Four Mile Run and have firsthand knowledge of the situation Barb described that I don't have time to get into the details of. I also know that our mayor, who is a driving force behind the Mon Oakland Connector, has a seat on the PPC board. At best, it's a bad look. Adding the phrases citizen participation and full public disclosure to your ballot question doesn't make them reality. Those things are required by the law of public agencies, and even then, the law gets bent or broken. I gain some of my knowledge through right to know requests. Would this privately operated fund have to honor right to know requests? We owe our children accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey. Hi, welcome. Thanks for coming down tonight. Hello, my name is Heather McLean. I'm a resident of Beachview. Um, and I just want to talk about why I have trouble feeling good about this tax. Uh, first of all, it's a change to the Home Rule Charter, um, which to me is a drastic thing. Um, and how 
how exactly is that going to look far, far, far down the line um, as our housing prices go up? Um, and you know, a hundred thousand dollars right now is high for a lot of households, but maybe not in the future. So that's going to be a big lump of money. Um, also, the cost increase is not just going to hurt homeowners, it's going to hurt renters too, because then it will be put back on us. And the city has um, really not the best plans for dealing with displacement. Um, mm. And then um, the equity language. I'm hearing a lot of equity language for this project specifically, but I wasn't hearing that equity language in the past when it came to talking about our parks. So why are you talking about equity now Thank when you, you want the public to pay? Appreciate it. Okay, if there's no one else wishing, okay, we do have one more. Welcome. I have permission. Um, <laughs> I look Thank right you. At him. Uh, Maura yeah. Kaleida, res reside in Beachview. Uh, I just want to speak very quickly about uh, three things tax priorities. If we want to talk about um, doing a tax to fund parks, and if we want to talk about priorities in our budgeting system, we should budget them within the democratically elected council who has control rather than putting it in an outside source. Uh, to good government kind of feeds into the same thing. Uh, we need to make sure that this money is accountable and not run by a nonprofit or anything else that is run by our elected leaders who, if you guys don't do what we want, we can vote you out. Uh, three, uh, inequity, and this is, I kind of go to Heather's point right before me, but the equity uh, that is being, the language that is being used is um, gaslighting uh, at, at its best. Uh, we know that from the history, from uh, what has happened in uh, Minneapolis, that the where Jane Miller uh, came from, that the inequity was um, very large between black and white neighborhoods. So uh, let's not pretend this is the resolution. Okay. Thanks, Thank Mara. you. Okay. All right. That's it. I'm then going to close the public comment portion of the council meeting. I'm going to open it up to members that, who may wish or may not wish to register comment. I know Councilwoman Kale Smith has asked if she could, so I will lead with her. Yes, thank you, Council President. I want to thank you all for being here. I actually did call for the public hearing, and it was because we had residents that wanted to be heard, both for and against, and those just, who just wanted to make some comment. And during this time waiting for this public hearing, we did a lot of research ourselves and seeing some of the articles that I'm going to share with you shortly. I, I just want to say that I appreciate people coming down. I appreciate that we've had the public hearing, but I also have a lot of concern. And it's having concern doesn't mean, as people have said before me, does not mean you don't love your parks. We love our parks, but there's, we can love our parks, love our kids, and all the things that, we're, that you want us to care about and not have to raise our taxes. Uh, especially when we're talking about raising them and not knowing exactly where they're going. And we have nickeled and dimed our residents to death. They are tired of paying additional taxes for things they don't have oversight over, and they don't know where those dollars are going. But the thing that was concerning to me is the way race and equity, be, equity has been used throughout this argument repeatedly. And yet I see I'm looking at a predominantly Caucasian audience. And if you really wanted equity, and you really wanted to make sure that you were being fair to everyone, maybe hire a few executive directors that are of minorities. And so I just want to say that point number one. Um, that might get the, the word across. Uh, and it, would, it is our most democratic space, and we want to keep it that way. And I fear that going down this road, it's going to take that away from us. And so I, th I want to point out that we do have great parks. Everybody talks about our parks. And Meg Cheever, you have done an amazing job in our parks, and so I want to thank you for that. But I also want to thank Erin Tobin, who does work in our district tremendously. She does a lot of work, and she works for Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. But I want to say, even that, well, I appreciate all that you've done. I don't buy this argument that we need to raise our tax right now, especially when you have an article on your page about how Pittsburgh was voted one of the top 25 park systems among the U.S. parks number 25, so it's not, it's not as if our parks are so deplorable that we need to run out and go raise taxes or that we don't have time to fix what's going on in our parks. I also looked into Minneapolis and the way that you're talking about um, the parks in Minneapolis, but I've, I've looked at, I mean, please do look up the inequity or inequality in American public parks, and there's an article about, uh, about Minneapolis. 
and the soul of uh, the battle soul of Minneapolis Parks Board. And the a board head apologizes as racial issues raised again or raised again. There's article after article. So when we're talking about this kind of stuff, it is just talk as far as I'm concerned because your past actions certainly have not, or typically don't predict your future actions. And so I'm just going to say for, um, for me, when you're talking about what you're going to do, you've had 20 years to do some of the things that you're saying that we need to have done. 20 years and if those things were so important to you if a west end park was so important to you we just had the first visit from pittsburgh uh, parks conservancy probably about two years ago in a west end park and that was with aaron tobin and 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 uh doing some work up there um, but i looked at all the nonprofits that are here tonight and a lot of you do work in the city so you know as much as i appreciate all that you do in the city i think the the reality is that a lot of you depend on doing uh, on the city and the support of the uh, administration to do some of the work that you're doing. And I think the, the in theory, the idea of raising a tax sounds great and what we're going to do, be able to do sounds wonderful, but the reality is very frightening and where this might lead with us to us you know, in the future with our parks. I wanna keep our parks very public and I, I've heard that said a million times uh, you know, that that's the way that we'll keep them that way. but. I've also heard some things that are really concerning, especially when you're talking about forming a special committee to oversee our parks. And when I know that, uh, you know, when we talk about some of the, uh, the way that funds have been spent over the years, I can tell you on our side of town, that they've been spent on in, in the park on Grandview in Mount Washington, the Emerald View Park. And those trails are even in a you know, kind of difficult situ difficult condition right now. But that was something that Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy was responsible for on our side of town. And yet you've heard it in the news repeatedly um, over the past um, couple months about how the, how the condition of Grandview Avenue and those trails are, are just not uh, good, uh, optimal at this, at this time. So I don't know why we'd give additional responsibility. I think that we do have to have a conversation about what we do and how we take care of our parks. I think that that's something that you, you know, we all should have probably talked about before it got to this point, as soon as we realized that there was an issue. And it, we, our foundations fund a lot of stuff in the city of Pittsburgh. And so if, to expect them to fund this nonprofit or other nonprofits for a long time is probably not reasonable. I mean, because we're asking them to do more and more in the city. And I think maybe what we ought to be doing is sitting down having a conversation, how, what, it, what are our priorities and how we can keep some of the nonprofits uh, float that really, really are do benefiting our city. And the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy has benefited our city in many ways. I'm not saying it's been a perfect job or a perfect situation, but they have benefited our, benefited our city in many ways. I also think that a lot of nonprofits benefit from the city too. So I think that it's a conversation that we have to have and what our priorities are. We also have a lot of trees that need cut. We have a lot of uh, equipment that needs replaced. I don't know that raising this tax tomorrow or, or next week or you know election day, I don't know that that's gonna get us the funding we need um, in my lifetime. So I, I'd really like to have the conversation about what needs to occur and how we can uh, find the funding in other ways without Imp uh, impeding upon our residents one more time because I think that our residents as people have talked they're struggling they've been struggling and we just continue to put additional burdens on them and so I'd, I'd like to make sure that we're sitting down having that conversation but thank you for being here okay. uh, are you concluded councilwoman I'm done I'll probably come around ten more times because you know I'll forget th something I wanted to say um, <laughs> no, there, I won't. I promise I won't. <laughs> are there other members that wish to offer a comment at this time? Councilman uh, Coghill. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. <clears throat> you know, many times I, I always say when we have a public hearing like this, I come in with one opinion and I listen to everybody. And, uh, you know, it helps. It helps shape and mold my opinion. Um, however, in this case, I still have the same opinion that I came in with. I vehemently adamantly you know oppose attacks i really do okay for for a number of reasons um first i want to talk about the process okay and i hear a lot today all a lot of the pro park speakers were talking about this most democratic space in the city of pittsburgh i agree with that but uh the process to raise these taxes was not democratic we don't have an opposition okay we have the parks conservancy spending their money and lots of it I would love to get an amount of that money. Jane, if you're still here, I don't know. But I would love to get an amount of the money that they spent in campaigning for this process. There is no voice to oppose it. 
thank God, you know, Councilwoman Kale Smith called this meeting tonight, and I'm grateful for that. At least we get some a different view other than just the Parks Conservancy view. Um, so the process to me uh, just was not right from the beginning. That million and a half dollars, I'm guessing, because I have yet to get a, a, a straight answer from the Conservancy. I'm going to guess, though. So. I mean, I got, you know, ZD held them up. I got seven, eight of these, honest to God, okay? Seven, eight of these. We all saw the commercials. They're beautiful commercials. I know what it costs to run a good ad, okay? And they're on all, they're on 24 hours a day, I feel like. So, so the process to me was not fair, okay? The million and a half dollars, I'm, again, I'm not, don't quote me on that, but the million and a half dollars that the Conservancy, I feel, put into this campaign, it's a campaign is what it is, it's a political campaign. Um, I could have, all my parks in my district could have been improved to the point where we're just fine. The same parks I grew up in. I grew up in these parks. I know how important they are. I agree with everybody who supports the tax. I do. But the same parks I grew up in look the same today as I was as a kid, honestly. And yeah, there are improvements to be made. And I will tell you as a contractor, I can go into any park anywhere in any city in this country and I could drum up $50 million worth of improvements just by new wall, new road, new bridge. It's easy to do. We all have needs. All these parks have needs. I understand that. Um, so the process to me just was not right. I feel like we don't have opposition to this. We don't have a voice. Nobody's willing to put a million and a half dollars into saying, hey, we don't want this tax. But I'm going to say it. You know, I don't want this as a tax. I love our parks. Our parks are great. We need them. I, I, I agree full, wholeheartedly with everybody here that says, you know, how important they are to child development, to our community, to everything. It's ex absolutely true. Um, but I want you to just look at my perspective, okay? I'm a guy, you know, I, I live on the border, Dormont Beachview, okay? Dormont being a suburb, okay? It now costs less to live in Dormont in taxes, if you add it all up and whatever you're saying. Uh, to live in the city of Pittsburgh. Now, we have a great, I'm a product of Pittsburgh School District, okay? Uh, my chief of staff, Moore Kaleida, is a school board member. They do a great job. But the fact is, Pittsburgh Public Schools underperform compared to, say, Keystone Oaks, my neighboring uh -huh. district, okay? So, for what reasons, you know, I'm not sure. That's not our responsibility on council. But I will say, it's harder and harder for me to I feel like a real estate agent for my district in many ways. I say trying to promote, whether it be young families, whomever, to start businesses, buy homes, be there, you know, and, and give them a good reason to move to my neighborhood. Well, now I just got one less reason to, you know, try to support and try to promote my neighborhood. Uh, it's just another tax. And don't get me wrong. It's to a good, good cause. I love the parks. Everybody knows the importance of the parks. But I will say this, you're driving people out of the city. It's making it harder for me to sell my district to people who want to buy a home because they're going to pay more in taxes. Um, the, the school district, they will argue all day long with you, is not as well. And, uh, you know, so what incentive can I, again, I, not my district, my, my, this particular neighborhood of Beachview, many of you are familiar with, I see Phyllis back there. We're struggling there. We have been struggling for years and years. Our parks have not changed. I, you know, I'm not saying they're in desperate need of repair. I'm not saying that they're not. They've always been in desperate need of repair. Most parks have been. So I'm adamantly against raising taxes. We have enough taxes in this city. We're taxing people out of the city at this point. You know, I understand, um, you know, and Jane, you know, I love what she does. I know she's an expert in the field. And when she came to town, she stressed, you know, she's going to raise $20 million in 10 years, this is what she told me, versus $10 million in the last 20 years before she came here. But I didn't know she was going to do that through taxpayers. That's a no-go for me. I hope and I plead to anybody living in the city of Pittsburgh not to vote for this tax. It's going to cripple me as a real estate agent, councilman, whatever you want to call it, in trying to promote my neighborhood. It's, uh, you know, give us a reason to, to live here and not a reason to walk out. So that's just my thoughts on it. I've been against this from the beginning. I feel like we're taxed to death. Uh, last thing we need is another tax. Um, it's just, uh, you know, if the parks, you know, don't get me wrong. I love the parks, but 
if they're not this much of disrepair, so be it, is what I say. You know, I mean, we cannot make it more expensive living in the city of Pittsburgh when their choice is right next door to me. And I have a declining population. Pittsburgh has a declining population. And why is that? Because, you know, it's not attractive to move here. And the more we tax them, the more they're saying, see you later. So, uh, you know, with that, I want to thank you all for coming. I appreciate, I respect your positions on it. I really do. Um, I just feel it's better not to raise taxes on this. And one final thing I want to say, if this were a city controlled thing, this is a, this is a nonprofit. This is something that the, us as city council members are not going to have say so in how these taxpayer dollars are spent. They, Jane could say to, till she's blue in the face that we're going to have a board member and we're going to make sure. But you know what? The bottom line is the taxpayers elected me to be a fiscal overseer of our taxpayer dollars. I can't do it. When, when, when we're raising taxes for the parks, that's out of my control and we have no say so over it. And you know what? Until Jane puts a solid on every park, what she's going to do, and the improvements that are going to be made, and if they're going to be made immediately, then maybe we could talk. But just to have faith and trust in a, in a, in a nonprofit that they're going to take care of the five or six parks in my neighborhood is not good enough for me. So thanks for coming here. Appreciate all your opinions. Okay. Thanks for uh, Are there other members? Councilwoman Harris wishes to register comment. Okay. Uh, I've been a no vote since the beginning, and I'm still a no vote after listening to you tonight. Um, everyone's leaving because they don't want to hear what you have to say if it's a no vote. What we should do with this is maybe anyone making $100,000 a year pay 5% of their pay, of their hundred. dollars per 100,000 to the city to put into a fund for our parks. Because the people that are living on $9,000, $12,000, $25,000 a year can't afford it. Matter of fact, they can't even get a babysitter to be here this evening. Some of them don't have cars. And it's very sad that, you know, I remember when we went out as a council to look at the neighborhoods. And as we went around and looked, we were saying what needs done in our neighborhoods. Um, the ones that make the money are getting their neighborhoods done. I mean, $7.6 million a year for four parks. Only when did yours come on, Teresa? This year, last year? My parks last year. Last year. Okay. That's what we had. Seven point maybe seven million dollars between four parks. Uh, Shenley looks terrific. Frick looks terrific. <coughs> Highland Park was getting there. Riverview Park has landslides, had a landslide that wasn't fixed with another landslide and then someone decided to come in and widen natural trails, and then we had more landslides. And Riverview Park did not get their share of $7.7 .7 <laughs> million. But they were supposed to be equal going across the board. And we always say we're going to do for the poor districts. Well, that was said maybe 10 years ago, and here we sit, and the poor neighborhoods are still getting nothing. That includes asphalting streets. Go out to, Sh go out to uh, Shadyside, Squirrel Hill, and you'll find their streets look really good. 
go into the south, go into the west end, and go to the north and parts of the east, and you'll see what it looks like. It's not fair. This tax isn't fair. There's people that own our house, and they shouldn't have a backdoor, backdoor tax coming in that they don't even realize is coming with a bunch of yes papers coming in the mail and a commercial, what, every half hour coming on saying you want your parks beautiful. I love parks. The park in my neighborhood has not had any help towards that, that park. And probably since Pepsi put the park in. I mean, where the kids are supposed to roller skate, there's no paint. I mean, I was embarrassed when Home Depot come up to help out, and they couldn't even really do anything for the bad shape it's in. But, you know, time and time again, you can talk about how you want to do for the poor communities and help those children to have a park, and yet, again, Go look in Squirrel Hill, look at Chenley Park. Again, look at Frick Park. It's not fair. It's not fair. And it's not going to be fair. I don't care what you say because we've done this, we did this with Doug Shields, rode around and looked at each other's neighborhoods. And it's worse now with this administration than ever before. Um, if there's a will, there's a way. And, hey, I don't have a problem with people make $100,000 a year, maybe every $50,000 put 5% in of your paycheck instead of going after these homes. Or, or get the nonprofits that aren't, have not given zero zero to this city <clears throat> since Mayor Ravenstahl was the mayor. We say there's 165 parks. Quite a few of those are the tot lots where we asked the city to actually shut them down because of the drugs. And we're going to count those at, as parks. How about by hand on the north side? Talk about fishing and fishing in Highland Park. We fixed for the kids fishing contest. Down by the river, we had, we had memorials set up for, for Bob O'Connor. And, I mean, it was great. And it got all torn apart by this administration. And there's no more fishing contest and no more fishing for the children in that area. Now tell me that's not a crock. How about we got the soccer field and had $1.6 million left and money was supposed to be added to that to build a building. So Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, clubs could go there. Senior citizens could exercise there. And Mayor Peduto decided he was taking that off of the north side. So there's zero money there. And oh, by the way, that's, that's in Riverview Park, again. Um, <clears throat> the pediatrician talked about what we got to do. Uh, our kids, blood pressure, obesity, 
stress. You know what? When we had neighborhood schools, they walked to schools. And those kids didn't have blood pressure problems and obesity, very few, or stress. That was all left off by walking back and forth. I did it. And so have many of you walked back and forth to school. Matter of fact, there is still one municipality that's still in the county, still walks back and forth to school. So, I love parks. Jane knows I love parks. I have no problems with the Parks Conservancy. They have raised money. They've been great with the city. But to put a backdoor tax. By the way, this was the mayor's campaign chairman, Matt Marion Preston, that got all the signatures for this. That was not the Parks Conservancy. The Parks Conservancy is sort of just put there as a wall. This is political and it's not fair. And it's not fair to the entire city of Pittsburgh the way this is being done. It's, it's ridiculous. What's it going to be next year? Every time we turn around, somebody's trying to put another tax on. What was it? Last year, education? The kids tax. Yeah, we we're going to do great things for kids. As long as you have the money to campaign for it. Right. As long, well, that's how you stay in office, too, as long as you have the big bucks uh, to campaign. But uh, I cannot say that all the Pittsburgh public schools are bad. Obama, Obama was the Shenley and it went to Roosevelt and it's Obama now. It's a great school. And older days is and has been a good school. Whittier. A great school. What do they do there now? They decide to take the principal at midterm and move them around. What? So we lose more people in the city of Pittsburgh? But in closing, Thank you. I want you to know I love parks. Jane knows I love parks. Anybody in the district knows I love parks. I love the outdoors. I have raised so many wild animals, and I live with them. I have woods all around me. I don't live on a concrete street. <coughs> but this is a terrible thing to do to the poor communities. And people can sit there and they can laugh because they make the big bucks. But a lot of our neighborhoods don't make the big bucks. This is going to be a hardship and it's wrong. If you want to do something, I get, you know, get on, get on all these nonprofits that aren't paying anything and let them give for these parks. They have it to give. I've talked to some of them and they're waiting for one of the biggest ones to start giving first. So I will be a no vote on anything that has to do with a backdoor, uh, backdoor tax. Okay. And they say we don't have money. I don't know if you all know it, but there has been $200 million in bonds taken out <clears throat> just in the last five years. And there's supposed to be another $60 million this year. Tell me where that money has gone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, And Council thank Wolf. you all for being here. Uh, chair recognizes Councilwoman Gross for closing.
Thank you. And I stress closing. Thank you. And I will be brief. I promise. Um, I always want to say thank you when we have a public hearing because I know that it takes time and effort and energy to come down. And it is so valuable for council members to be able to hear your voices directly um, and all together, right? So that we're hearing also from other people's districts because we don't often get to do that. Um, and it's also, of course, in the legislative record and it's available to the public to hear your voices as well. Um, I have had some concerns, I think, that I voiced earlier at the post agenda that we had about a month ago that Councilwoman Smith, I think, also motioned for, isn't that right? Um, and chaired. Um, and about some of the questions that were Councilman Coghill's questions because he wasn't able to attend that post agenda about the financing of the campaign and whether and how the public can find out about those funds, whether it's being reported, which funds are being reported on the nonprofit accounts and which funds are being uh, reported on campaign finance accounts. And we had that discussion. And again, the public can look that up on our city council website on Legistar and that uh, post agenda is on the record there. Um, there are also some questions I think about uh, following up on this notion about how these funds would be managed uh, were the referendum to <laughs> succeed um, and the oversight and accountability that I think we heard some testimony about tonight. What surprised me tonight is uh, I kept track of the proponents and the opponents and this is what I did not expect. Um, that uh, the opponent, the proponents who are here tonight were mainly affiliated directly with the Parks Conservancy or the board or other nonprofits that they worked with, but also that 80% were from the East End um, and predominantly talked about the desire to invest funds in non-East End neighborhoods and lower income <coughs> neighborhoods. And of the opponents, 80% are from those low and moderate income neighborhoods, not East End neighborhoods. Uh, Brookline, Westwood, Observatory Hill, uh, Beachview, Manchester. And that gives me pause, right? So who speaks for whom, right? It's our job to hear directly from our constituents and from city residents and trust that they speak for themselves. Um, additionally, this notion that uh, I, I, I believe the proponents fervently believe themselves that this tax increase would be an investment in, peop in equity. Uh, but I also believe the opponents who fervently believe and argue that the tax increase is inequitable and, a, and an undue burden on rental incomes, uh, certainly that half of our households in the city are renter income, uh, renter households, um, and that we have a significant percentage of households that are low and moderate income who would be disproportionately impacted by this tax increase. Uh, so I'm inclined to fight no personally. Um, and again, I was surprised to see how dramatically different the proponents and opponents of the measure are. I'm, I'm, I'm struck by that. That's all I have to say. Okay. No, okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I too would like to just take the opportunity to thank you. This is democracy in action. This is, uh, I, I say this every public hearing, but I say it because I truly mean it. It's the favorite thing that we get to do here is to interact directly with the public. Have you come down, speak to us directly about your, uh, you know, your concerns, your, uh, you know, your thoughts, your desires. Um, again, I will stress that this um, referendum does not originate at the council table. Uh, the, this is again democracy in action. If the public at large wishes to see something like this placed on the ballot, I certainly will not be one that will stand in the way of having the public decide for themselves if they wish to see this or if they do not wish to see this. I would just encourage those that watch city council regularly to do their homework, to investigate, to read, to research, uh, and, uh, and uh, find your process by which you will decide whether or not you support this or do not support Support this. Uh, with that, I would uh, ask if we may please have a uh, motion to adjourn yeah, this public hearing. Can we just hearing. remind folks that they, regardless of how they feel, if you you have to vote, you have to vote whether you're supportive or not supportive. 
uh, that's on, on stress, election day. That's stressed enough. It's, it's, it's up to you, not up to city council, to say no. Right. I mean, you know, uh, back to us, but the, it's, the it's councilwoman sort of brings a good point. You, you, uh, most likely, we're looking at a 9 to 11 percent turnout in this uh, upcoming general election. That gives me great pause uh, in, in consistently stressing how very important it is to be a part of the process, to be engaged and come out and let your voice be heard. So with that, may I have a motion to adjourn the public Second. hearing? Second. Second.